Project 2025, the conservative leadership mandate, is literally a 900-page document that details the plan for the first 180 days of a conservative presidency. Well, actually, Project 2025 is way more than just a document. It's an extremely organized, built-out strategy based on four pillars. Pillar number one is this. This book is called A Policy Agenda. Mandate for Leadership, The Conservative Promise. Think of this as the policy Bible. I did not come up with that name. The entire book's sole purpose is reshaping federal policy and shifting societal norms in America to align almost exclusively with conservative values. Pillar number two is a personnel database where conservative scholars, academics, and policy experts are being compiled. Think about this pillar like a conservative-only LinkedIn. The authors of this policy set a goal to have at least 20,000 recruits already built into the personnel database as a way to have a readily available pool of ideologically aligned people to pull from when it comes to filling all of the positions that they plan to create, fill, or vacate when taking the reins of the government. Again, these are their words, not mine. And they're doing this as a way to streamline the confirmation process. Make sure that there are zero hiccups. Pillar number three is their Presidential Administration Academy. It's an online educational system of training programs specifically for those potential employees under the role of a conservative president. Again, the goal here is speed. They want the ability to just plug and play. Pillar number four outlines the transition plans in a 180-day playbook. The 180-day playbook is driven by the policy agenda itself. And so if the policy agenda is the guidebook, then think of the 180-day playbook as the roadmap. These four pillars together are what makes up Project 2025. Okay, thank you. Now I know what Project 2025 means, Deja, but why should I even care about this? What does the conservative promise even mean? Why are you bringing this up? Well, my curious friend, I'm glad you asked. The average age of an empire is 250 years. Can you guess where we are on the calendar? It's okay. Pause this video for a second and do some math from 1776. And then I want you to do with that information what you will. I've been reading this book for the past three months and it's made me realize something interesting and it's that there are three major factions in this space. Conservatives, Republicans, and the Christian right. That's who we need to watch for. I know what I'm telling you. That's who we need to be afraid of. They are all different and it's important to note that they don't always agree, but for the most part, the purpose of this project is to make sure that everyone who identifies with conservative values, meaning on a basic level they share advocacy for limited government, upholding traditional values, supporting national defense and free market principles, is aligned with the four conservative promises that are made in this book. The project itself is spearheaded by a conservative think tank known as the Heritage Foundation. Chances are, if there's some major conservative push for a form of legislation, you can bet your bottom dollar that the Heritage Foundation has their hands in it. Everything is in here. They liken transgenderism to pornography and go so far as to say that anybody, even teachers who are distributing types of media that detail this type of pornography should be jailed and registered as sex offenders. Teachers. While the plan definitely criticizes the normalization of transgenderism, it's important to understand that this is a part of a larger, broader agenda to control cultural and educational narratives. The authors see it as restoring the family as the centerpiece of American life and protecting our children. The way that they plan on doing that is to remove content that is deemed inappropriate by a reasonable person from schools and libraries and only allow materials that reflect conservative values. There's a new bill in West Virginia that says librarians can be charged if it's found that they shelve educational content or books that they've deemed inappropriate. And there's some people who think that this bill will keep kids safe, but there are others that are worried librarians, teachers, education providers run the risk of being charged or getting blamed unfairly just for having a wide array of books available, which could include useful educational content. This personally stresses me out because I hate the thought of librarians being afraid to offer certain material affecting what I have the ability to read or learn about. Several states have already either removed criminal liability exemptions for public and school libraries, or they've already started expanding the definition of what they see as obscenity to capture a wider array of books. That could potentially result in criminal charges for simply having them on the shelves. Imagine your health teacher being arrested for teaching sex ed. 
Please don't think this is coming. This is already happening. If you're worried about the lack of action on climate change, it's because they're already focusing on how they can benefit from things like permafrost. It's not a priority. How can we make money off of this? In fact, Project 2025 explicitly aims to end all current climate change efforts. It's advocating for a complete reversal of initiatives like the Paris Climate Change Agreement. It goes real hard about making sure that we know that America's energy interests are going to take a huge priority over any environmental concerns. This plan includes everything, Ugh. including ways to expand operations in places like Alaska in order to better harvest its rare earths, natural gases and oils. It even includes plans about Antarctica, where the authors plan on capitalizing on things like shipping and tourism in the area. It'll be a no going back shift towards fully exploiting natural resources for economic growth, as well as abandoning pretty much all climate change mitigation efforts. I'm going to quote the policy agenda directly here for a second, which refers to environmental extremism as anti-human. Environmental ideologues would ban the fuels that run most of the world's cars, planes, factories, farms, and electricity grids. Abandoning confidence in human resilience and creativity in responding to the challenge of the future would raise impediments to the most meaningful human activities. They would stand human affairs on their head regarding human activity itself as fundamentally a threat to be sacrificed to the God of nature. My problem here is it's not that they don't believe in you, brother. I personally, no doubt about it in my mind, believe in human resilience and creativity. It's actually that I just have much more faith in the power of greed. And this here assumption denies the reality of unsustainability. It pushes for the US to remove itself from any association with the UN or any other efforts to create sustainable development priorities, especially especially those that are connected to food production. And that just seems way more anti-human to me. Or maybe it's that it was both eight degrees and 80 degrees in January this year. But alas, I know nothing. And I'm sure the planet's fine. They're trying to get rid of all DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, language from all legislature, all of it, except for religion. They want vast, robust protections for religion. Yes, the goal is to eliminate what they see as indoctrination from anti-American, woke revolutionaries, divisive critical race theory programs, and DEI initiatives from all educational and governmental institutions. The authors believe that talking about race in nearly all capacities creates an inferiority complex. This is again a part of a larger effort to promote a conservative agenda and push certain conservative perspectives, ideals, and values. Some of the recommendations the authors provide include vast protections for religion and religious tax exemptions. Question for you, class. In what timeline should we have pastors whose net worth is close to a billion dollars? He made it. He made that airplane so cheap for me, I couldn't help but buy it. It calls for issuing executive orders banning the use of equity-focused language, basically throughout all instances of public office and private sectors. It also calls for Congress passing a law prohibiting the federal government from using taxpayer dollars to fund critical race theory training. This is already happening. There's a venture capitalist fund called the Fearless Fund that was created solely to fill the gap of less than 1% of venture capital recipients being black women, despite black women being the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. The group has been hit with a lawsuit from the conservative group American Alliance for Equal Rights. They aim to bleed the fund dry and it's working. It's working as intended. Do you also find it funny that there were no lawsuits presented when less than a percent of the population was being provided the same opportunities as other populations? I find it funny, but not like in a ha-ha way. Like in a, I don't really want to tell you what to think, but maybe think on that for a second kind of way. To me, this begs the question of how do inferiority complexes come into play while simultaneously being torn down by parties who have a vested interest in demonstrating superiority? Most people just have to go up against their inner critic to get things done. We should be able to acknowledge that some Americans are playing bootstrapping on X Games mode. That's where you have entire establishments standing on your straps. 
First and foremost, the U.S. must prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear technology and delivery capabilities and more broadly block Iranian ambition. While focusing on foreign policy, specifically on the broader Middle Eastern strategy, Project 2025 pushes for a continuation of conservative emphasis on national security and energy dominance. The policy agenda specifically states that if an internal organization is effective and advances American interests, then the U.S. should support it. If an international organization is not effective and does not advance American interests, then the U.S. will not support it. Make no mistake here, this is important for you to understand as an American. There is a commitment to supporting allies like Israel, no matter which president we have. We already know that this is a strategic priority focused exclusively on maintaining influence and access to resources in the region. Policy agenda also calls for the Palestinian Authority to be defunded, as well as prioritizing keeping Turkey in the Western fold as a NATO ally to prevent any hedging towards Russia or China. When it comes to Africa, the authors of the policy recognizes the abundance of resources that Africa offers. After I liberate the Jewish people, I will go to Africa to help liberate the black people. It also recognizes that lately, as Africa's strategic influence has grown, U.S. influence there has declined. Sub-Saharan Africa has been fundamental to the global prosperity of the advanced countries. Okay, and Africa had a role to play. It has a role as a raw material producer. We will not allow Sub-Saharan Africa to escape that. Okay, we do everything to keep Sub-Saharan Africa where it is, also impoverished. It's absolutely vital for the prosperity of everyone else. So let's get clear about that, okay? So they wanna shift their strategy from assistance to growth. Some of the tactics that they wanna to use to do this include phasing out humanitarian aid, the recognition of Somaliland statehood, and a focus on supporting American companies that are involved in industries that are important to America's interests, or those that already have a competitive advantage in Africa. To combat African-based terror groups like Boko Haram, the authors recommend that the U.S. support capable African military and security operations to provide foreign military education, training, weapons, and security assistance. This is just the tip of the iceberg of foreign policy. Side note, did you know that America has almost 800 military bases in over 70 countries and territories while having no foreign military bases on its soil? I found that quite interesting. Onward. The reason why this document was so scary to me is because this isn't the first time it's happened. The first time they actually laid out a plan like this was with Reagan, and they were able to enact 60% of what they wanted achieved based upon having it all laid out already. 60% of Reaganomics was already laid out. Indeed, Reaganomics was trash. But do you know what's even more trash-like in nature? The realization that the Reagan administration's success in implementing such a large chunk of the ideas from Mandate for Leadership showcases the impact of them having such detailed planning. 60% of Reaganomics was all it took for us to arrive here, still waiting for our trickles the middle class all but disappearing into an in-between space where American and blue collar workers are paying higher tax rates than billionaires. This is why we're talking about this today, class, because this isn't just a bunch of fanatics writing manifestos. Don't be so dismissive. We're getting put on game up front. Project 2025 aims to replicate that success. But peep this, you don't need a time machine or a flux capacitor to take you back to dropkick baby Reagan into another profession to undo the damage done by his administration because you have this book that is highlighting the strategic importance of these documents and the impact that they have in shaping conservative administrations. It's right here. It's right in front of us. You know in the movies when one of the main characters is geeked to unveil their plan to take over the world and then they start monologuing? This is the monologue. This is the monologue. It's even more frightening because there is an attack on education, an uneducated population, you are able to sway consistently with propaganda. To be fair, I actually like the idea of transferring education to the states in principle, but in actuality, it also makes me wonder, if every state's allowed to teach something different, how will we ever close the gap on the very real problem that is America's revisionist history? Also, it makes me wonder about if you're in a poorer state with lower home ownership. Less home ownership means less property taxes, which funds schools. How might that impact the quality of the education you receive overall? 
This one is for extra credit. Take this time to guess how the top 10 poorest states in the nation tend to vote. The policy agenda calls for changes to ensure that schools comply with the colorblind ideal. It's asking that the next administration create a parent's bill of rights that schools have to abide by. And in this bill of rights includes the right to support and provide relief to parents who sue educational institutions for teaching or talking about critical race theory or teaching American history in any capacity that isn't celebratory of its total awesomeness. I'm not kidding. They're arguing that teaching America's full history is equivalent to defending the false idea, the false idea that America is systemically not as nice to some people as it is to other people. And to do so, to even teach that, is a violation of the parents' rights and the parents should be allowed to sue with support of the federal government because of that. No problem with parents having rights, but for me, wait, how exactly does creating multiple realities through historical fiction create alignment, remove division, and better our country overall? I'm still waiting on that answer too, young Padawan. I'm still waiting on that answer too. Oh, by the way, this too is also happening. So I challenge young people to read this, post about it, talk about it, discuss it. To be totally fair, there are some things in the policy agenda that I agree with and can empathize with when I put myself in the shoes of a conservative. But what I have found is that it is often very short-lived because of the potential implications of such broad overreach that you start to realize is sure to happen by giving the president ultimate power in the way that this policy agenda suggests, specifically with the minimization of so many checks and balances. A lot of the plans outlined in this book are rooted in the taxpayer not paying attention. And I don't know about you, but I hate when a company's entire business model is banking on making the system so complicated or making it so hard to cancel that you just become so overwhelmed with the process that you just give up and let them take your money. Any business model that is dependent on your ignorance should not be a sustainable business model. Hit after me. American ignorance should not be a part of the business plan. What will happen, we'll eventually get to the point where these things are happening and we'll go, how did we get here? How did, will Pikachu face it? How did we get here? This is how we got here. No one raindrop thinks that it started the flood. Pay attention. This part is called the call to action. But for you, my friend, we will call it how to feel less helpless, AKA act. I'm not here to make you angry. As I said earlier, there are a few things in this policy agenda that I'm actually on board with. I'm not trying to stoke your rage. Why do you lay these troubles on an already troubled mind? I am no fear monger. I want you to feel empowered. More specifically, I want you to join me in educating ourselves. But Deja, I don't feel empowered. I feel helpless. You know, now what are we gonna do about it? Rot. No, that's not what we're gonna do. There's people who have a vested interest in you rotting. Stop it. You're not as powerless as you think. Step one, make a new email specifically for your activism so you don't get overwhelmed. Step two, make a Reddit post or meetup group to meet people in your area who also want to feel less helpless. It doesn't have to be like-minded people. It's okay to challenge your views and learn. Don't be afraid to learn. Step three, register to vote. Step four, register to vote. Step five, register to vote. No. I'm serious. Pop quiz. Let's pretend you were an American citizen who wanted to fully exercise their voting rights in America. How many elections should you be voting in every few years? Did you guess at least seven? Because if you did, you are right. You should be voting in seven or more elections to fully exercise your voting rights as an American citizen. If you don't have at least seven elections under your belt, I'm sorry, baby. Now is not the time for rotting. Seven, where did you get seven from? So you know the big ones, the federal elections. These are held every two to four years. Your presidential election held every four years. You vote for the president and the vice president, Oppi. Then you have your congressional election. Okay, I, I skipped poli sci. What is Congress even made up of? I'm glad you asked, boo. The condensed version is Congress is made up of two parts, the House and the Senate. The House of Representatives is made up of members who are elected based on the population of 50 states. 
Each state is divided into districts, and each district elects one representative. The total number of representatives is 435. These guys serve two terms, with all seats up for election every two years. The House is responsible for bringing revenue bills, impeaching federal officials, and electing the president in the case of electoral college ties. Do you see why it might be important that the person representing your district has your best interests at heart? Next, we have the Senate. The Senate consists of 100 senators, meaning there's two senators per state. These guys serve six-year term, but they're staggered so that there are elections every two years. Their powers include the ability to ratify treaties, confirm presidential appointments, and conduct impeachment trials where they act as the jury. All bills must pass Congress before they go to the president to be signed into law. You also have your state elections. These are going to vary by state, but this is going to be your gubernatorial elections. I like that word, gubernatorial but that's who you're electing for your government. Typically, this is every four years, but check your state. Then you have your state legislature elections. You have statewide offices like Secretary of State, the Attorney General. And then closing out state, you have the primaries, which are to figure out who is going to be running for President of the United States. Media will make it seem as if it's already a shoe in or that it's set in stone, but it isn't until it is. Step six, shop local. Local elections are gonna have the most immediate impact on your day-to-day -day life. Get extremely interested in what is going on in your immediate space. That county clerk who's able to prove or deny your marriage license based off of their religious views? Electable. That sheriff whose officers seem to have a problem with keeping their body cams on? Electable. That judge who's more interested in policing teenage hair instead of serving the needs of the community? Electable. That DA who rarely prosecutes insider political crimes? Electable. Electable. Totally electable. Are you awake yet? Step seven, open up a new tab. Summon chat GPT-4. Type this into your search bar. Give me a list of local elections in my city and state. After that, be sure to ask for the town hall schedule in your city. To fully exercise your voting rights, you need to participate in all the elections that you can, not just the presidential or midterm congressional elections. Local and state elections are way more focused on the direct impact of your daily life. Problem with your street lights? Hold your county commissioner accountable. Hold your mayor accountable. Don't like what's happening at school? School board elections. You also want to pay attention to special elections. These are usually held to fill vacancies that occur when an elected official resigns or can't complete their time, which can happen at any level at any time. You feel hopeless because you haven't realized you have the power to take the jobs of the people serving you if they're not serving you. It's time to stop consuming and start creating. Attend your town hall or city council meetings. Some cities even live stream their city council meetings, so even if you can't make it in the physical, you can still be present. Chances are, if your demographic is not showing up to these meetings, your interests are not being represented. Americans need a third place anyway, right? Why not make it a field trip? Once upon a time, I was a supervisor in a call center. And one of my favorite memories from working in that place was coordinating time off of the phones so that me and my team were able to go and vote together. And for some of them, it was the first time that they had ever used their voice. Hey, I'm gonna pull the race card here for a second, I'm sorry. We were doing so good at keeping up with the colorblind idea. But if you are a person of color in America, you have a responsibility to use your voice. This is not optional. I need you to understand that there were anti-literacy laws in place at the same time that Rockefeller was starting to build his fortune. I'm going to pause here for dramatic effect. I really need you to sit with the thought process and desired effects of concentrated efforts to make reading and learning illegal. Nonconformity isn't piercing your face or getting rage bait content tattooed. That's easy. Nonconformity is you and three of your wanna feel less helpless homies rolling up to a town hall meeting to have a say of what's going on in your community. Better yet, grab a couple felons to bring along with you. Depending on your state, felons never lose the right to vote, contrary to popular belief. Yet another American myth that no one bothers to correct because it's to someone's benefit that you stay asleep. You run a really rage against the machine? You wanna be a true anarchist, brother? Stop allowing old, out of touch, people dictate your future. Every time cancel culture opts to cancel a celebrity instead of the elected officials whose job it is to shape our laws, somewhere in the world, a villain belly laugh is born. Stop giving these people jobs. Every time you allow someone undeserving in office, you reward mediocrity. Stop allowing these people to keep their jobs without performance reviews. You have performance reviews at your job, don't you? Shouldn't those in public office be held to the same level of evaluation? 
Your boss doesn't just forget to tell you when you're not doing your job right. They're not too busy to fire you. They're not too overwhelmed to let you know that you're not measuring up. That doesn't happen. But if you showed up, only two things can happen. Change, or we start the process of pulling the Scooby-Doo mask off of the entire farce. But if you're not voting, you're complicit in corruption. And maybe, maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe let's not do that. You know what? We'll call it trickle up accountability. This next step is optional, but important. If you are someone who just honestly does not have time to advocate for yourself, here's what I want you to do. Find a nice, quiet place to sit down. Open the settings of your phone. Scroll down to screen time. Make sure you select week view. That part's important. And I want you to stare at the highest number of hours and the name of the app that you gave your finite attention to. If you have more than two hours of screen time in any app, it's all love. No judgment. I get it. But perhaps we can see where we can carve out a little bit of time, budget, if you will. And after that, let's kindly return to step seven. Alas, we have reached the end. For my longer attention span, homies, thank you for being here. Short form content is ruining your brain and the revolution will not be bite-sized. I want to leave you this quote to mull over while you expeditiously follow me to join me and catch upcoming videos of breakdowns of Project 2025, ways of increasing our media literacy, balancing politics with mindfulness, taking care of yourself, and more from my tragically optimistic heart to yours in my journey to overcoming capitalistic nihilism. From author and journalist Chris Hedges, who writes in Empire of Illusion, a society becomes totalitarian when its structure becomes flagrantly artificial or well wrote. That is when its ruling class has lost its function, but succeeds in clinging to power by force or fraud. They have engaged in massive fraud. Force is all they have left. There are powerful entities, fearful of losing their influence and wealth, arrayed against us. They are waiting for a moment to strike, a national crisis that will allow them in the name of national security and moral renewal to take complete control. The tools are in place. These anti-democratic forces. Welcome to the end of democracy. We are here to overthrow it completely. We didn't get all the way there on January 6th. Which will seek to make an alliance with the radical Christian right. To, oh, forget, oh, to oh, get rid oh. of it and replace it with, with this right here. That's right, because all glory, all glory is not to government, all glory to God. And other extremists will use fear, chaos, the hatred for the ruling elites and the specter of the left-wing dissent and terrorism. Missouri GOP candidate for governor was only an honorary member of the Ku Klux Klan. To impose draconian controls to extinguish our democracy. And while they do it, they'll be waving the American flag, chanting patriotic slogans, promising law and order. And by then, exhausted and broken, we may have lost the power to resist.